wasn't it? Wasn't it awesome? Isn't it awesome to see God working through us that way, using us that way, and it just being hands and feet? I think it does so much, uh, so much good for this community when we just let Him work through us, and it's been so exciting. Here at FCC, though, we try to work hard every day to be a church for God and for you. It takes every one of us to accomplish that. It takes everyone committed to following Christ uh, daily to accomplish everything that God has planned for MCC. But I'm excited that you are all here today. I really, really am. It's exciting that we're all here uh, singing together, praying together, taking communion together, uh, hearing message and fellowshipping. That, that's the way God intended it to be. God is stirring hearts and transforming lives all around us. You guys know that? He is doing that all around us. And I want everyone, everyone to be a part of it in some way. We need to bring more people in because we'll just do more. But there's so much going on. It's so exciting. So on that note, let's just jump right into the sermon series called Nonfiction. Today we jump into a topic that Mike already hit on in this communion meditation, atonement. Specifically the atonement of Jesus. If you are here today and you don't have a relationship with Christ, I really want you to listen today because it's crucial to understand what Christ did for you. And if you are a Christian here today, it's still important to you to fully understand what our Messiah, what our Messiah willingly did for each of us. One, so that we never forget, and two, so we can take that information and share it with the world around us. Okay? Now, some of you may have heard of atonement, but by a different name. Things like the atoning sacrifice, or our redemption, or reconciliation, or Christ's sacrifice, or maybe Jesus paid our debt. You may have heard of atonement in these kind of terms. The thing to notice about atonement is that God takes the initiative in man's salvation, which is wonderful because otherwise I don't know how we get there. But he takes the initiative. It is his son. It's his plan. It's his timing. Atonement is the work of God. He opens the door for sinful humans to receive his pardoning grace. We sinners, that's all of us, we cannot know God. We cannot bridge the gap between ourselves and him without God's plan. You see, he opened a new way. And it is the only way to receive all God has to offer. The only way for us to be saved is through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Now the word atonement is used to signify the sacrifice that Jesus Christ offered, um, offered for our sins by his death on the cross. It means the, the reconciliation between God and all of us. We are made one with God, brought back into a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. If we choose to accept Jesus as our Savior and we repent of our sins and follow Jesus into baptism, we've made the choice to accept this gift of salvation. We've made a, uh, a choice to say, thank you, Jesus, for your atoning work. Now, the thing about this atoning work that Jesus did, it's, it's more than just an act of obedience to God. I mean, that's part of it. He willingly did this. He did this to, to follow God's will. But Jesus died as an act of love for all of his undeserving and confused friends. And that includes us. Jesus died for all the people he served because he, 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 he would not, he could not be stopped from pursuing justice for them. Even if it enraged the powerful people of his day, especially uh, the powerful religious leaders of the day. And Jesus died for those powerful people as well. That's the funny thing. He did this to allow those who think they see to become blind. Right? They think they get it. They think they understand what God's all about. But they don't have a true understanding of it. So he did this in the hopes that they would become blind to what they already thought the real truth of the scripture was, what the real truth of God was, and see what Jesus did for them. For those, this is, he did it for even those who sold their soul, so to speak, for, for the, the idol of power, to have power. They just wanted to have the power of ability. He died for them even in hopes that they would get it. 
Jesus even died for us. People who had yet to be born. His one-time atonement, this one-time atonement, Jesus of God, continues to matter. It continues to be offered because the Holy Spirit is there. You see, through the Holy, or through the power of the Holy Spirit, rather, Jesus' love and sacrifice continues to be extended to all of us today. Who's saying that? We have the Holy Spirit in them. I do. I am. So if you have the Bibles, that's those things you see some people carry. It's those things that are in the pews in front of you. Please open them to Isaiah 30, or 53. Isaiah 53. Now, Normally on 452, I choose a passage different than what he goes into 452, just to give you some more perspective and so I don't, uh, you know, give away any secrets that's in the 452 book. But this one, there's no way I'm passing it up. Because like the students, they all know that Isaiah 53, 5 is my jam. That's my all-time favorite scripture, right? So there's no way I'm not preaching from Isaiah 53. It's just not going to happen. Uh, but this passage is magnificent. It, it's, it's truly the heart of the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's incredible. I believe that if we had a Mount Rushmore, just Old Testament scriptures, you know, you know, this listed up on a rock, a big mountain somewhere, this one would be more than one on Mount Rushmore. Isaiah 53. It would be up there. That's how crucial, how important this passage of scripture is. And today we're going to focus our attention on verses 4 through 6. And in this prophetic chapter uh, regarding the Messiah, it speaks of future events as if they occur in the past, right? They're talking like these things have already happened, but they haven't. The inspired prophet speaks so vividly of the unimaginable horrors of the cross of Calvary, where the sinless uh, Son of God, Jesus, died for the sin of others. Yet, those key events, even though they're written so vividly like they're in the past, they're not really going to occur for another 700 years. That's how amazing this passage is. Now, for all of you who have placed your faith and hope in Jesus for salvation like me, the words of this passage become so important to our walk with God. We need to know them. We need to understand them. Because of them, we can claim with confidence that an innocent, sinless Jesus, the promised Messiah, suffered and died for our sin and and not his own. This passage answers one of the greatest questions of all that gets asked many times. How can a sinful man be reconciled to God and get, and get to spend eternity in heaven in God's holy and sinless presence? This helps answer it. This is the answer. Because Jesus carried out the atonement for all mankind. He died in our place. As we read these verses 4 through 6 today, I want you to please notice, this is important. Jesus did not die because he couldn't stop what was happening to him. No, 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 no. He didn't suffer because there was no way out of the situation. Don't forget who Jesus is. He's God. So if he wanted to stop it, he could have stopped it, right? No one could have touched him or arrested him. Even Pilate and his great army could not have done it if Jesus had not been willing to be captured. This is the real heart of these verses in Isaiah 53. As we read them, let your eyes see, your ears hear, and your heart be open to the thought that Jesus died on purpose. It was no accident. He died on death so that sinners like you and me could be saved. He did it willingly. In these verses, you're going to see that you and I are in the words are. You and I are included in the we's of the scripture. And you and I are in the us's for whom Christ died. Jesus died for us. What he endured, he endured for us. Think about it. The humiliation, the pain, the brutality, and the indignity of the cross. It was all for us. Jesus' last hours, those, those hours we always read about starting on Good Friday, they weren't his fault. It was our sin. And the sin of those who were alive at the time. The more 
we see ourselves in the passion, or in the passage rather, the more the death of Christ will mean to us. When you see yourself as you're reading these kind of passages, it will mean more to you. Jesus faced an unthinkable death for you and me. It's personal. In these verses today, we're also going to see three things that belong to each one of us that Jesus willingly took on himself. So let's go to the scripture, Isaiah 53, verse 4. How was our sickness that he himself bore, and our pains that he carried? Yet we ourselves assumed that he had been afflicted, struck down by God, and humiliated. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him. And by his wounds, we, that's every one of us, are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. It's a mic drop moment right there. I thought those three verses are. They're so powerful. But the first thing you notice when you read these, or one of the things you notice rather, is that Christ took my burdens. And that's each of us. Personalize it. Christ took your burdens. Jesus made my illness, my sorrows, my griefs, and my pain his own. The image is that he loaded them up, put them on his back. So we wouldn't have to, right? It's the image of a high schooler who hates his locker and puts every book in his backpack, right? It's my baby remember walking in the hall like this, right? Bent over because the backpack's so heavy. Christ carried every one of our burdens and sorrows, which includes our sin, which Jesus willingly allowed to be placed on himself. That includes the guilt that I that I'm carrying, you're carrying, the hurt that we feel. Because of the hold that sin may have on us, he took every bit of it. Christ carried them all. Our griefs, my griefs, my pain and sorrows, all your griefs, pains and sorrows, all our brokenness disappears as he takes all those burdens upon himself. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior from sin, we also call, or we also uh, come, rather, to know him as the one who can lift the burden of sadness from our shoulders. We can bring our grief to the, to the Messiah. But here's the thing. You got some grief that you carry? You start to hand it to Jesus. Don't play tell the Lord. Let it go. It's not easy. But you gotta let it go and let him take it. That's the only way he can help you move forward and get through it. All those kind of words. Let go of them. Your old sin. Let it go. Guys, ladies, gentlemen, kids, students, every one of you. Let it go. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're putting your sin, you'll have to let go of all my words. Guess what? The Bible tells us those sins are what? Leave it with Christ. Live free and serve the one who wants and is willing to lighten your load. But that's not all Christ took. Christ took our suffering. He took my suffering. Jesus was familiar with my, with my suffering. He, he was familiar with suffering as a whole. His suffering began at his birth. What? They didn't even have a room for it. We can't just roll over. Suffering started there. It continued as a young child. His family had to run, had to hide, had to get out of Dodge because he was going to be killed if he was found. They couldn't go back to their original home. Um, as he grew up, he became a man. And as, as he went out and did ministry, right? He was a man who had no home. Our Savior was a homeless man. And his whole ministry, what? 
People were, were hunting him down. They were looking to mess him up. They wanted to arrest him and kill him. He understood suffering. He got it. He, he touched people. He healed people. He talked to people every day that were going through so much stuff. Jesus understood suffering. However, none, not one of those, not any of those sufferings could hold a candle to what Jesus suffered on Friday. The Friday of his death. Now it's the morning. We're going to talk about it for a minute. So this is the PG-13 part of the sermon. Okay. We're not going to go any higher than that, but it is PG-13. So if you've got a young one in here, I just want you to understand that. His final sufferings became... After dinner with his disciples on that Thursday night, as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, many of you know this already, but Jesus prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And here's the thing, he did pray that three times, but it's not just the prayer. We know that Jesus was in agony and his soul became overwhelmed as he was praying for this. He even asked his friends, his closest friends, to stay up, watch, and pray with him. But of course, they just fell asleep. Jesus continued to pray that same prayer three times. So much so that we believe he sweat blood or that his, his sweat was like drops of blood. That's how intense this moment was, what he was going through inside. But then after the third time praying, the soldiers came, led by another friend, Judas, who betrayed him with a kiss. Here in the garden, the disciples, what they do? Well, they tried a couple, they tried initially to fight back. Jesus stopped. But then what happened? As the soldiers arrested him and took him away, they were gone. They, were, they fled. They went in different directions. As Jesus was arrested and taken away by force, his friends turned and ran. And as the night and morning continues, Jesus endured more humiliation and suffering at the hands of many, many people. He was brought before the high priest and Pilate, or high priests and Pilate and Herod, where false witnesses were, were hurling accusation after accusation at him. They spit on him. They, they mocked him and they beat him. <coughs> then later, he was scourged. Right? He was whipped with a whip that had pieces of bone and rocks at the end of it. His flesh was torn from his body. He was stripped later of his clothes. He had a crown of thorns put on his skull. And then they pushed him down. They didn't just lay it on him. They pushed him down. They made him carry his own cross to his place of execution. His own cross. He was walked, and as he walked, the crowds were there. And they weren't cheering for him like they were just days earlier as he entered Jerusalem. No, they were mocking him. Some spit on him. He was hit. He was made fun of. He was being yelled at the whole way to Golgotha. And then, when he reached Calvary, when he reached that point, they laid the cross down. They threw him down after stripping off all his clothes. They nailed him to the wood. And then set the cross upright. I can't even think of what the gas for air that Jesus probably searched for in that moment when that cross goes into the hole in the ground. He's got to fight for each breath he's getting now. And then as he's there on the cross, just fighting for any, any kind of air he could get. He's, he's being mocked further. He's being insulted. He is, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're gambling for his clothes right below him. He's thirsty. He's dehydrated. He's got the whole weight of his body hanging on that cross. The cross beams are there. They're restricting every breath. 
And it's all there until he finally cries out, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. Jesus suffered so terribly between the garden and the cross. It seemed as if God was displeased with him. But in fact, he suffered willingly for you and I. There's a dad who, who, who tells a story about a time when his two young children did something wrong. Although they were gently warned the first time, they repeated the events, so they needed to be disciplined. The father's tender heart was pained at the thought of having to punish the ones he loved. So he called Jimmy back into his room. He removed his belt, bent over bareback on his bed. He told each child to whip him 10 times. Oh, they cried. They said, no, no, no. But the penalty had to be paid. They had to be disciplined. They had to be disciplined. Someone had to pay the price. The children sobbed as they hit their dad on his back. Then the father, after it was all over, hugged and kissed him, and they prayed together. He recalls that it hurt, and he says, but I never, ever had to spank them again. You see, Dad not only took their suffering and their punishment, and Christ took my punishment, took your punishment. <coughs> Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is what? Death. Sin deserves the sentence of death. So Jesus piercing, crushing, scourging, and death satisfied God's wrath against us. Yeah. God's wrath against us. Not because of being people and, and he's just hated people. He hated sin. So it was because of our sin that there was wrath. And he, Jesus, took all of that. All our sins. He took the wrath. He paid the penalty for my sins, your sins. He was innocent. He was sinless up until that. Jesus died to do his Father's will. He lived and died for others, not because of any disapproval from, from God against him. He didn't worry about that or, or personally, but because God's love might redeem us and shine in our lives. That's why he did the Father's will. The atoning work of Jesus, if you don't, didn't know it before, I hope you see it now. It's very personal. Christ endured everything for all of us. It's global in nature, but it should be personal to each one of us. He did everything for you, for me, for me. And I'm going to open up today and tell you why it's personal for me. And many of you probably have the same reasons. One, I should have been whipped. That should have been me. I should have been spilling. I should have had to stand up before a screaming mob. I should have been traded for a murderer. I should have been carried, I should have had to carry my cross up that hill. I should have had all my clothes torn off. I should have been nailed to the cross. I should have been in pain and torment and thirsting. I should have died physically, and I sh should have died a second death in hell. That should have been me. But because I repented of my sin, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I followed him into baptism. I have been spared. I love. I have been made right in God's eyes. And I have the hope of spending eternity with them, with Christ, with Jesus. And I want the same for every one of you. I want to close this message with a story from the life of the British preacher, Brown O. North. He lived a, a very wicked life before he was saved. 
And one evening as he entered a church where he was going to preach, a stranger walked up to him in a hurried manner and said, here, here's a letter, letter for you, Pastor, great importance, so I'll get out of your way, and, and, and I want you to read this before you preach tonight. Okay. You know, in today's thing, uh, Josh and I probably just assume it's some announcement one of you needs us, needs us to make at the end of the service, right? So he, he wasn't too worried about what it was. <clears throat> But thinking it might be an announcement or a request for prayer, he immediately opened it up and found that it contained a detail of some of the wicked things that he had done in his past. The letter concluded with these words, how dare you being conscious of the truth of all of us, pray and speak to the people this evening when you are such a vile sinner. He put the letter back in his pocket and when it came time to preach, he pulled out the letter and read it to the people, told them exactly what it said. And then he said this to the full congregation that was there. What I just read, what it said is true. And it is a correct picture of the degraded sin that I once was. And oh, how wonderful must the grace be that could raise me up from such trespasses and sins and make me what I appear before you tonight. A vessel of mercy, one who knows that all of his past sins have been cleansed away through the atoning of the Lamb of God. Today's takeaway, like the atonement of Jesus, is also personal. Jesus died for me, so I will live for him. This is going to all mirror this week because I'm just going to make this my wonder. Keep that in your heart this week. I guarantee you, when you think about everything Christ did for you this week, as you go through your day, through, through all the things that are going to happen this week, one, they won't hit you as hard. There's no way, doesn't matter what you're taking, there's, there's no way that seeing all God did for us that it can make a difference. That it can, that it can, or not that it can make a difference, but that it can outweigh anything you're dealing with can outweigh what he dealt with for us. It's just impossible. So one, it'll put everything in perspective to you. And two, it's going to make you want to see Jesus more, be with Jesus more. There's a gospel song, one of my favorites. It's called I Bow on My Knees and Cry Holy. You can Google it today. The best version to get local man my language, just telling you that right now. But anyway, in that song, he says, he's in heaven, he's talking about being in heaven. He says, I saw Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, talk to Mark, and Timothy. And I said, I want to see Jesus. Because he's the one who died for me. All due respect to Leon Eisenhower and David Johnson and my grandparents and my nephew Austin and all his friends and family that are up there with him right now. I'm going to walk past every one of them to find Jesus. Because without his atoning work, there's no hope for a wretch like me. And I'm going to hold on for a dear life to see you. Jesus died for us, so we 